what we're, having, what we're now going to do is to have a question and answer session. Uh, and Tom is going to be joined uh, um, in answering the questions uh, by three people from Hacked Off, um, by Hugh Grant, uh, Charlotte Harris, who are both directors of uh, Hacked Off, and by uh, Joan Smith, who's the executive director of Hacked Off. So, so if anybody would uh, uh, put their hands up to ask questions uh, to, uh, uh, to um, any or, or all the members of the panels, Panel. I think we'll probably probably the easiest thing is to take them in batches of three, j just so that um, and then the panel can respond. So uh, the, the first one, I've got a gentleman here in, in the middle. Thank you, and uh, Tom, fantastic speech. So thank you very much. Um, my name's Ian Puddick. I wanted to ask the panel, where do the Met Police fit into all of this? Because they swear an oath to uphold the law, and they clearly chose not to. Journalists don't swear an oath to uphold the law, the police do. So wh where are the police in, in all of this? And when are they going to be held to account? Thank you, Thank you very much. We'll take a question from the... Thank you. Um, my question actually follows on rather neatly from that one. Um, related to something that Tom Watson's, I think, started discussing in the newspapers recently, um, the case of the suspected paedophile ring at Westminster. It seems very relevant, this connection between the police the press and politicians, and it seems that this theme is coming up again and again. I wondered if perhaps the panel could talk a little bit about whether unfinished business exists in this area as well. But those two questions rather neatly fit together. Should, should we deal with those questions first? The panel, I don't know who wants to deal with it. First of all, Tom? There's a, there's a microphone. Okay. Listen, will you not ask all the questions to me because you've got three brilliant other panellists, so think about your questions. Um, look, on, on the Met Police, what do we know about Met Police? But part of, I mean, Ian, I just said, I think Leveson 2 is the correct way to look at the relationship between the police and, and the press. There are a number of criminal inquiries and, and other inquiries that may relate to the police. What do we know about the Daniel Morgan murder? We know the Met have already admitted that corruption was at the heart of the failed investigations in the past. Theresa May has bravely, in my view, created a, an inquiry, it's had some teething troubles to say the least, that will try and examine how we ended up with five failed criminal inquiries. And, you know, let me just, uh, you know, let me be a Labour MP for a minute. I, when, when Theresa May was, um, Came Home Secretary in 2010, I didn't have much hope for her. I thought this is a classic conservative hangover vlog of rhetor rhetorical sort of uh, speech making uh, Home Secretary. And I think she's been the opposite. Uh, and that's because in her, on her watch, she's had Hillsborough, Hacking, Plebgate, Daniel Morgan, a whole series of uh, scandals that afflict mainly, the, afflict mainly the Met Police. And I think she's determined to sort of find out what's going on and we should support her in that as long as she's in office, which, uh, from my point of view, will only be for about five months. <laughs> there may be others who have a different view. And that's the same with the criminal inquiries and the national inquiry into organised child abuse. I won't dwell on it in this audience, except one thing, there was one significant fact that, was, that came out from a very brilliant journalist, Liz McKee, when she revealed that special branch suppressed a criminal inquiry into the conduct of Cyril Smith. That state, a, a state agency, for some reason, closing down a legitimate criminal inquiry. We need to understand how that happened. We don't know the conditions around it yet, but I'm sure we will do when this inquiry is finally running, and I suspect we'll find more cases like that. I have a strong suspicion of that, but we don't know all the facts yet, and it's not in the public domain, but we need to let this inquiry get moving on it. Joe, uh, jo, uh, as well as responding to the question, it may be uh, um, you'd like to say something in response to Tom's speech as, as well. Um, on the on level of part two, I think that um, Tom's talked very well this evening about the ways in which Levinson's part one has been misrepresented as an attack on journalism and so on. And a lot of tabloid journalists will say, well, look at the police, they got off scot-free in Levinson one. And that's one of the reasons I think it's important to have Levinson part two, because it was quite proper that that first inquiry shouldn't go into affairs and, and matters which could have prejudiced, prejudiced criminal trials. That was quite right. But I don't see the papers who are saying that the police got off scot-free. Got I don't see them saying, that's why 
now we have to have levels in part two. We've got to get to the bottom of this. So it's very, very important that the public and MPs take up that call and say there has to be levels in part two. And on Tom's speech, I'd just like to say it's fantastic to hear a politician get up and say all the things that we in this room believe really passionately about both the freedom of the press and the way in which it's abused, some of it has abused those, those freedoms. And I think it takes a lot of courage for an MP to stand up and say that because the press is still very pow powerful. So thank you, Tom. And um, yes, congratulations, Tom. We couldn't have done it um, without you. Tom goes back such a long way um, with this from the very start when um, making inquiries to the police as a lawyer came back with um, literally nothing, that there had been no hacking, there was nothing, there was evidence, but that evidence didn't necessarily mean anything, and would we stop writing to them? And actually, it was Tom um, and his encouragement at the very, very early stages that really helped get this going, because there's nothing more encouraging to um, a person who continually has um, no as an answer, and I'm speaking of the victims here, to get um, some, some really um, heavy backing, and I have to take that person. <laughs> Um, just, in, just in terms of the police, um, and um, drawing on what um, Tom said in his speech, um, and something that we can all do, um, Tom talked about the change in attitude um, that the papers have shown um, when it comes to um, how journalists have been treated by the police, um, the early morning calls, and compared that to Chris Jeffries. Now, I don't think anybody here would like the police to be um, acting inappropriately <coughs> with anybody. It's about hypocrisy here. But one of the things that's extremely important, I think, for um, us to think about going <coughs> forward is making sure that these false claims that um, are, are being made in terms of um, um, inappropriate police um, um, behavior is, is looked at properly. So, for instance, the police have to behave themselves they also have to investigate, but when you find um, journalists writing um, vitriolic um, pieces that say, oh, it is completely wrong to, um, um, to investigate this, these people have, um, got, um, have done nothing except um, investigate legitimately, um, there, has to be, there has to be a reply, because I, I think what's happening is every time there is um, somebody arrested and somebody, um, and somebody um, gets acquitted, what happens is that there is um, um, a celebration that doesn't look, at, doesn't look at what's happened in an objective way. And that's why Leviton 2 is important, not so that the police can be historically criticized or that there can be any, um, um, any sort of dancing about um, acquittals, but so that we can get to a stage where the police act appropriately in all situations and we can feel that there is some public trust again and not just spin. There's been far too much spin for and against and we all have to be careful of that ourselves and at the same time really encourage Leveson to, to look into it properly. Good. I just have a quick question. Um, we have a very shy and retiring member of the panel. Uh, I, I've been reminded I failed to introduce myself. I'm Hugh Tomlinson. I'm the chair of Hacked Off, and I'm um, very shy and retiring. Uh, um, so do we have some more questions? I think there was some, someone over there was the first. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name's Emma Burnell. I'm the contributing editor of Labour List. Um, we're a blog site. Um, my question is, I, I used to want to be an MP, and I can't now imagine anything worse in the world. Um, and part of the reason is the culture that has developed through the press and through the politicians. And I think that what you're doing is really interesting and important in terms of the structures. But what can we all do as public figures, as bloggers, to actually change the culture that exists? My name is Chris Clark, and uh, just a member of the public. And the question I have for the panel is just to ask, um, is anybody aware of how many cases have gone to Ipso so far in the months they've been in existence, and have any been adjudicated on, and what's the, what's the shape of the adjudications? One more. Hello. Um, I'm a hospital campaigner, and I went to see Ed Miliband um, speak 
speech in London about a month ago and the press were quite rude and I went up afterwards and I tore them off a bit of a strip because I'm a very worried, concerned human of this United Kingdom, only for an MP to tell me about a week later, oh, did you see yourself on YouTube? Um, the BBC had panned right in on me, recorded everything and posted it and I've got about three and a half thousand hits. Fantastic, but you know, being the sort of person I am and I suffer a bit of anxiety, it was quite intimidating because I had no idea that they could pan from the back of the room and record absolutely everything I said, which luckily was polite. Um, but what I would like to ask is, do you not think the one way, number one, is to put the owners on the stand? They are ultimately in charge of their businesses. Um, and I would expect they to take the full force of the law of the legal system and also hit them very hard in their pockets and I would also encourage everyone to boycott and um, get the advertisers to stop advertising. I think they would get the message pretty quick. Thank you very much. Should we take one more question? I'm sorry? Okay. Um, my name is Francis Durham. I, I'd like to say I'm rather despondent that there will be any real change with the press. And I think the problem uh, is, really, it's the, the public who buy these newspapers. And there is a real issue there. I don't go into, say, a supermarket and see... Well, I go into a supermarket and I see the, the Daily Mail and the Sun, you know, just rolling off the arm. Off the stands. That's the real problem. And politicians just cannot say it's the public that's at fault. And, and whilst uh, the likes of Murdoch have these people in their grip, I doubt really there can be major change. We all here can, you know, think we're doing right. But, you know, when you come to really making real change, I think you've got a real problem. And it's Thank you very much. Before I turn to the panel, can I just answer the question of fact about it? So it has, it has made no adjudications of any kind uh, uh, um, since it, uh, no resolution. So it's actually done nothing since the 9th of September. Uh, um, now, the panel, uh, to, to the, the other question, thank you. Well, I was, I was going to add something on the IPSO point, which is that they have the most, the most useless website I've ever seen. Um, it's actually very hard to find, and it's very, very uninformative. And if you look at the old PCC website, what's happening is that IPSO is um, responding to com it's the, what they call uh, legacy complaints, I think, from to complaints that went to, if, to the PCC but haven't, weren't resolved when it was round up, wound up. They are kind of adjudicating those, but it's appearing on the defunct PCC website. So it's actually quite hard to work out what on earth is going on. So it's, it's worth looking at both those sites. Um, I think there is a culture of bullying, um, and it worries me a huge amount, and I think that the kind of um, monstering of people that goes on the front pages of the tabloids almost every day, actually, and it, it catches MPs like everybody else, and I think it's inhuman, and I think it also kind of undermines the democratic process in this country, treating people as if they're not really human beings, and how one deals with it, I think... When you talk to journalists who've worked in tabloid newsrooms, and some, of, some journalists who actually now say that they were part of that culture, they will talk in turn about how they felt bullied. And I think we all know that people who are victimized themselves then go on to behave badly to other people. So I think what's the, one of the things that's very important in this is providing redress for journalists who feel put under pressure, who feel, who feel threatened, who don't have secure jobs and feel that if they don't join in this culture of monstering and bullying, that they might, might lose their jobs. So I think it's very important that journalist contracts should have a conscience clause. And I'd, I'd actually also like to see a kind of ombudsman on newspapers that, that journalists and reporters could go to if they feel, that, if they feel they're being pressured into do, doing something they think is either illegal or unethical. Because a lot of the things that journalists are asked to do are not necessarily illegal, but they certainly are unethical. I was very interested. Sorry, it's very loud. 
I was very interested in what the gentleman was saying about the market and, you know, is it all this pointless because despite the fact that in uh, repeated opinion polls, uh, the vast majority of the public's on the side of Leveson, the Royal Charter, Act of, uh, I think it's, what was the figures now, 82% or something like that, say, yes, this is fine. They, these papers still, as you say, roll off the shelves. Um, but I, the way I look at that is that they could still roll off the shelves without newspapers having to resort to bullying families who've just lost a child or um, uh, doing what they did to Christopher Jeffries or doing what they did to the McCanns. There was quite a, I mean, I think we need a tabloid press in this country. I'm not, I, I think it's quite a good thing that newspapers jump off shelves. I just maintain that it's possible to do that without abuses of process. And I, do, I think it's very important to remember that what Leveson really is about is about abuses of the process of journalism. And it's not about the content of journalism. Papers might well print things that we find un unappetizing or repellent. But to me, at least, they have to be allowed to do that. What they shouldn't be allowed to do is to break their own code of conduct, which is one of basic decency uh, on a, on a um, continual uh, uh, basis without any redress. Be recognised. 
How many newspapers have to sign up before it can do so? Thank you. There's a question at the back. Sorry, sorry. I think someone's had their hand up for a long time. Um, hi, um, my name's John Sweeney, and I used to work for Panorama, um, but I was effectively made redundant today. Um, as was my colleague Marion Jones, the producer. Thank you. Um, irritatingly for everybody who thinks the um, BBC is an evil conspiracy, the other producer uh, is sitting um, to my right and he hasn't been made redundant, or at least not yet. Um, but um, it was, we were very pleased and proud that the BBC um, finally and eventually put out the panorama on Mazda Mahmood. But we noted, and perhaps this is a cause for joy, you decide, the Attorney General wrote um, to us twice, asking us not to broadcast the programme, which clearly showed evidence of police corruption, and ev we thought, and evidence that Mazda Mahmood, in his own words, according to a police informant, um, was talking to a bent police officer and in his own words he had bent police officers as his informants. Who were these bent police officers? I asked, you ought to know I did this piece of camera outside New Scotland Yard and there were about 20 police officers listening to me as I did the piece of camera. I've got a loud voice and I kept on asking the question. I had to do about 12 takes but nevertheless I got there. So, the Attorney General tells the BBC Please don't broadcast this program twice. He said that it was potentially unfair to Mazda Mahmood because although he hasn't been charged, although he hasn't been arrested, so we were legally okay, it would be unfair to Mazda Mahmood if, he, if we went ahead. Now the question is, apparently it turns out that the police have yet to give their official report to the CPS. So is this a service the Attorney General provides to everybody in the country <laughs> who is in trouble with the police? This is something which I kind of wondered about as I've, um, <laughs> um, as I will, and I will continue to wonder about uh, my journey to the job centre in the coming months. But I, I'm interested to know, is this a way forward, uh, the, the resolution of Ben Jonas and Ben Coppers, the Attorney General will step in in every case? Or was this a favour for an employee of the Rupert Murdoch organisation? Thank you very much. Very thought-provoking question. One, one more. Uh, uh, um, some of Thank you, Chair. My name is Nigel de Grishy. I am a retired teacher trade union official. Can I go back to, to Tom in particular and raise the issues, is anything really going to happen in the longer term. And I think in this connection, is it worthwhile just mentioning Ed Miliband for the stand he made as this business was taking off? And when we consider the other leaders of political parties, those, either those present or those who may be present, has he that confidence in David Cameron that he will really pursue the matter? Or if Cameron loses, and heaven forbid Boris Johnson becomes leader of the Conservative Party, and may I therefore remind this meeting, Chairman, of what Boris Johnson said when all this business was taking off. I can't remember his exact words, but it was something to the effect that it was a ridiculous concoction of the Labour Party. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who would like to go first? Okay. Oh, I've got to remember all the questions there. But Nigel, it's great to see you here tonight. And, um... Look, I, 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 I'm not sure if this is public yet, so I'll probably be in trouble if it's not, but uh, I mean, as a display of intent, Ed Miliband has conducted a little uh, reshuffle today. I, I, I'm slightly looking at Angela to see if it is public. He's conducted a mini reshuffle, and he has made Chris Bryant MP the Shadow Minister for Press and Broadcasting. And if you, if you for me, I was elated, I was elated. Because Chris is, uh, you know, very, uh, has spoken out on this, and I think it shows intent if, if we ever get uh, into government. And just anecdotally and on a personal level, I owe Ed a great debt of loyalty for when he got up at PMQs and called for the B Sky B bid to be shelved. 
I don't want to take this away from any of the other people that run for the leadership of the Labour Party. I admire them greatly, and they are good friends of mine. But I think Ed was the only candidate in that leadership race that would have, that would have taken that decision. And he did it because it was the right thing to do. And that's the kind of leader I want to believe in. Um, and then John at the back. I can't believe you're here tonight, John, on your last day. It is brilliant to see you here. And um, what a what a programme to go out on, on the, on the Mazama Mood story. Um, I'm kind of sort of, now that you and Marion are not at the BBC, I hope you spend your time exposing what the senior management really knew about Jimmy Savile, because that is an unfinished business. And someone should hire you immediately to use your insider knowledge of the Beeb on that. And um, I'm going to take the Attorney General's advice, though, and be careful how I answer your question on Mazama Mood. Obviously, I've now asked the Metropolitan Police to investigate as soon as I saw Panorama, and they've written back to me to say they are considering what they are doing. It's a very delicate situation for both the Met and the CPS, and I think we should have some assurance from both organisations that the people who used to deal with Mazza Mahmood when he was feeding them the intelligence he'd um, got on his stories are not the people who are making judgment about whether cases should be bought or not. And um, I, uh, in, in light of what you said, I shall write to the Attorney General tomorrow to ask that he make sure that their own investigation, there is some division of labour when it comes to people who've had contact with Mahmood uh, in the past. Um, well, well it's, it's, it's fantastic that, that you're here, John, and I think it's, um, it's inexplicable that you find yourself in this situation after making that panorama. Um, on Ed Miliband, um, I think that Ed has been incredibly brave on several occasions in relation to the press. The first was when he, he called for the Leveson inquiry to be set up. He broke ranks and, and did that um, after the Dowler revelation. And again, when he stood up against the mail, when it, um, when it went for his father. And I think the lesson for that, the lesson for Ed and the Labour Party, and Ed is a very old friend of mine, I'm a great admirer of his, um, is that the, he has the public with him when he stands up against these people, because he is standing up for powerless people and people who don't know how to take on these press barons, and his voice is incredibly powerful when he chooses to do that, and I think he has the public behind him. And that's why I think what, what he decides to do going into the election and in, in, in relation to the manifesto is very important. As for Sheila's question, um, uh, imp it, 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 that's a very technical business about how you, how you get recognition, but certainly Impress is in the process of being set up, and it sim you simply have to have a, a, a particular number of relevant publishers, and that doesn't have to be just national newspapers. And I know that Impress is actually finding people who, who will sign up. And I think the other thing to say about that is that because Ipso presented itself as the only game in town, um, there was a sense in which people were saying, well, it's a fait accompli, there isn't anything else. There is. Impress is being set up. The other thing that I keep saying is that don't forget that Ipso is being set up by very powerful editors and newspaper groups, and they're very good at writing headlines. And I was on Channel 4 News with, um, with Fred Nelson from The Spectator, and he was sitting there saying, toughest regulation in the world, million pound fines. And I was saying, this, this is just spin, it's just headlines, because we've looked at how IPSO operates. And there are so many points at which newspapers can appeal against, um, against judgments that we don't think that it will ever get to the point of a newspaper being fined. And a couple of weeks ago, Alan Moses, the chair of IPSO, actually said that himself. He conceded that he had looked at the regulations and he can't see how newspapers are going to get million pound fines. So I think don't listen too much to the, the IPSO spin. And you know, I think Impress is on its way, and, and, and IPSO is certainly not the only game in town. Yeah, just with, quickly with regard to the politicians, I uh, absolutely agree that um, Ed Miliband was incredibly brave and a hero to do what he did on, uh, in July 2011 and snip the umbilical cord with, uh, with Murdoch, being the first party needed to do that for God knows how many decades. Uh, what we confronted after Leveson was published and when we were trying to uh, get it put into some kind of law or royal charter, as it then turned out, was, uh, uh, in terms of the politicians, was we had Labour staunch and, and on board and we had um, 
the Lib Dems certainly are talking a very good game and they seem to be very on side and that was fine. But it shouldn't be forgotten that we're also uh, a large number of Tories who backed what Leveson has recommended 100%. Uh, it's often thought that the Tories are, are by uh, nature and the majority against all this. That's not true. There's a significant number of Tories MPs in this last parliament who are completely on side. What we now face coming up to the election is to keep those three groups, those Tories, uh, the Lib Dems and, and uh, Labour, and I'm sure it won't be hard with Labour, um, uh, on side. When, you know, for politicians, I see this, it's, it's not easy in the run-up run to an election. You're facing, uh, you know, the electorate who are given their information to a large extent through newspapers. It must be absolutely terrifying to go to war with the newspapers in an environment like that. So this is the time when uh, politicians need their most courage and when organizations like Hacked Off, seems to me, have to be at their most uh, strong and most vocal uh, in insisting that those uh, politicians, including the Prime Minister, live up to the promises that they individually made face to face to people like the Dowler family or to Sheila Holland or to the McCanns. Uh, that they've got to they've got to be made to fulfill those promises right i'm going to take two more questions uh, i have someone here with a mic at the front yes okay thank you uh, i am andy miller i'm the guy who beat the daily mail after a six year fight six years <laughs> Thank you, I'll buy you a beer later. Six years, 11 judges involved, 11 days in court, the Royal Courts of Justice, the Appeal Court, and all the way to the Supreme Court. This was the largest libel action of its type in English legal history, and the costs to be paid by the Daily Mail are in the millions. And yet, the Daily Mail knew it was wrong even before I started my libel action. I had written personally to Paul Dacre a six-page letter which refuted point by point all the false and defamatory misinformation which they had published as their front page headline. The Daily Mail has never printed a correction to its readership, otherwise known as, a, as its customers, or an apology to me. They have even refused, in writing, to publish that they lost at the Supreme Court. Unbelievable. My case proves that the type of self-regulation that exists now is not working. They even have the nerve to suggest that the costs in my case were caused by conditional fee arrangements, or if you prefer, no win, no fee in simple English. With costs in the millions, there is no way that anyone except the super rich can take on a newspaper which libels them if conditional fee arrangements do not stay in place. So my first point is, Tom, you courageous man, please also stand up for conditional fee arrangements, otherwise it's only the super rich that can sue the bad end of the press. Self-regulation of this type always fails. The press actively supported the ending of self-regulation by the police, the legal profession, banking and insurance. But when it comes to the press themselves, they're getting away with not having to take the same medicine. This is terrifying. <coughs> Leveson was critically important, but has not been implemented. Why? Because perhaps understandably, individual politicians are scared to poke their heads above the parapet in case they are personally vilified by the bad elements in the press. But if all the political parties, Tom, not just the Labour Party, all agreed exactly the same wording in every single manifesto, then no MP who tried to put it forward or no political party would be advantaged or disadvantaged. So I think that the right answer on this is to make sure we get exactly the same wording about an impress-like regulator in the manifesto of every single political party in the country and to expose the ones who decide that they don't wish to. Thank you. Mark at the end, do you agree? Oh, hello. Hi, um, my name is Louise. I'm here on representing Jengba with my 
friend here, which is an organisation campaigning for the reform of the joint enterprise law. Um, the reason we're here is because we're concerned about how the media influences um, the, yeah, the justice system, basically, um, and that defendants will be going to court and actually judged and juried by the media. Um, and they're meant to be innocent until proven guilty um, by the jury. Um, and so, um, so, I'm not very good at public speaking, but my question is really because there's hundreds of people going to prison um, for offences, you know, for murder, where they haven't actually done anything or intended to do anything. Um, and very many of them are ethnic minorities, and all of them are working class. Um, so what my question is, is how will the Charter help people, defendants basically, that are going to court um, to get a fair trial? Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry to the, those who had their hands up, and, but we, we could stay here all night and we've actually got to come to an end very shortly. But, uh, uh, so my apologies for not taking any more questions. Uh, um, but I'll just go to the panel briefly for response to those two uh, final contributions. Um, just coming first to the CFA um, um, question. Um, CFAs are incredibly important. Without CFAs, it would be, as you say, absolutely impossible to ever take on the newspapers. And for the last few years, I've been working on so many CFAs, quite often um, law firms aren't hugely keen on you doing it the whole time. But the fact is that um, it is the only way currently um, to, to be able to defend people um, who, aren't, uh, who aren't hugely, hugely wealthy. And perhaps there'll be um, some reforms in terms of costs. We might get the um, um, one-way cost shifting um, and, um, and, and so on. But it's very scary, the idea that um, CFAs are going to um, stop, um, and they haven't stopped yet, um, but they've stopped partially, and so I think that um, we all do um, appeal um, to try and make sure that they, they keep going. And in terms of um, the question about how do we make sure that, I, I think the question is, um, what protections will there be to um, defendants from having their um, cases um, adversely judged in advance by um, the media and that causing um, that, that causing difficulties and, 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 and contempt and, um, and, and, and so on. And it's really important now that that does get addressed because at the same time as wanting to have um, a clear justice system and fair reporting, also um, we want to have, be able to um, hear reports as they go along and they're tweeting inside courtrooms. And so there has to be um, a, a very good look at how cases can be reported without that having an adverse effect um, on the defendants. But we have to make sure that the system is clear. And that's why when uh, John Sweeney talks about the Attorney General and Tom's answer was we have to be very careful that nobody's being uh, difficult here. It's just simply that these matters are extremely sensitive. And that's why um, we have to be cautious going forward. I just wanted to say that, like Andy, um, I, I used a CFA to go to court against the newspaper. Um, my phone was hacked by the News of the World in 2004, and when I found out in 2011, when I was approached by Operation Wheating and discovered that the News of the World had done this, well, I, I was actually writing columns for the time and the News of the World hacked my phone because they were interested in my private life. And it was the prospect of suing News International, as it then was, was completely terrifying. And without a CFA, I wouldn't have been able to do it. And it's because of being able, being able to get a CFA and a lawyer that we were able to go to court so many times on discovery and, and find out exactly what, uh, what, what the news of the world has been up to. So I'm a very keen supporter of CFAs. And if I could just take your point uh, straight on, I, 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 it would be wonderful <laughs> if the three parties could share a manifesto pledge, uh, or six parties, or however many, <laughs> seven, eight, fifteen, whatever, the, the, the main parties in, in Westminster. And, um, uh, you, you know, let, let's, not, let, let's not forget that it was a unique 
a unique occasion happened where the three main political parties, the three leaders, had a unified position in response to Leveson, which um, doesn't happen very often in politics when they agree that much. It would be great if we could continue that unity. And he was right to point out that there was a majority in the Conservative Party that were in favour of this as well. We, we all have our own internal democracy. Uh, and there's a whole complex process about how words end up in a manifesto. I think the Lib Dems have already, are already there. In a, they have a thing called a pre-manifesto with reform words in there. We have a thing called the National Policy Forum and a Clause 5 meeting. I'm hoping we'll be able to do that. And I think if the Lib Dems and Labour can show the lead on it, the Conservatives will be there as well. I hope so anyway. I can't speak for them. But you, you're right to point that out. The, the cross-party consensus has to be what we play for in this because it's, you, you know, it's such a unique set of circumstances. If we can do this uh, collectively across all sides of the House of Commons, then it's more likely to happen, I think. Uh, as far as I see it, and I'm a new boy to politics in any way, but it seems to me that a lot of that consensus was about safety in numbers. None of the parties wanted to be the only ones taking on the press, so that they, they were the only ones getting bashed. And that is exactly uh, the story of the whole campaign uh, since we started in July 2011, is that at the, at the beginning it was quite hard to get people to, to join vocally, to put their head above the parapet. They might say privately, it's great what you're doing, but they were scared. It didn't matter if they were uh, politicians or if they were uh, people in business, people in the show business, uh, they, were, they were scared. But what's happened is that we, are, we have gained over the last three years more and more support, and the more support you get, the easier it becomes, and eventually you have critical mass. And I feel that at this moment, we actually have critical mass, and that those four newspaper owners that I mentioned in Tom's speech are looking like an increasingly uh, isolated uh, little um, diminutive uh, little group. Yeah, so I, I do think it, a lot of it's about uh, safety in numbers, and I, fi I find that encouraging. As a, as a, as a natural pessimist, I um, feel strangely upbeat about what, what's going to happen. <laughs> I think on, on that note, we, we managed to extract a grain of optimism from uh, 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 Mr. Grant. I think that's a very good place to, 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 to finish, uh, and, and, and particularly on Tom's, Tom's point about the, uh, the extraordinary political unity we saw in response to Leveson and hoping, uh, as, as Andy Miller said, that we can take that forward uh, uh, over the next few months into the election. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, um, everybody, for coming. And Evan is going to now say a few words in conclusion. The panel are excused. So, um,